Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to YOPD Women. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Research at the Davis Finney Foundation. And today we are going to be talking about contraception and pregnancy and Parkinson's. So um, I'm excited for those of you who are the, here. I think this is a very specific topic. You either care about this and under, need to know about it or you don't. Uh, so hopefully those of you who are have a lot of questions and, and are uh, going to be really um, interested to hear what Kat and Sonia and Karen have to say. Um, and they're, they're all medical professionals. I'm the odd one out for sure. And uh, we're excited to, to talk about this topic. So uh, I'm going to introduce or actually let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit. Uh, okay, so Karen, uh, can you just tell us who you are and, and how you came to be part of the Women's Council? Sure. Hi, my name is Karen Frank. Uh, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at age 47, three years ago. I have practiced professionally as a nurse anesthetist for over 20 years. And when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, I retired from that profession. Now I spend my time as an ambassador for the Davis Finney Foundation. I do a lot of volunteer work with physicians and nurses who need help with overcoming drug and alcohol addiction. And I run a coaching business to help people with living well, uh, well, mainly recovering from addiction, but I'd like to get involved in, in uh, living well with Parkinson's disease. So that's kind of my background and I'm happy to be here today. Great, thanks. Uh, Sonia. Hi, I'm Sonia Mather. I'm a family physician and a patient having been diagnosed over 22 years ago, I believe. Um, I'm a proud uh, member of the board of directors for the Davis Finney Foundation, and I work with a number of other organizations. I also have a website called Unshakable MD, um, where I do talk about living well with Parkinson's disease and that sort of thing. And I also am a co-founder of the PD Avengers, which is a global advocate group. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Kat. Hi, everybody. I'm Kat Hill, and um, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the age of 48. And at the time, I was the director of midwifery for a large inner city midwife practice. I've delivered over 800 babies, and I am also the proud mother of three children. And um, I have a special interest in pregnancy and contraception. Everybody in my office was either one in need of one or the other types of help. They were either pregnant or needed to not be pregnant. So this is my clinical area of expertise. Um, and uh, since I retired, I've been doing um, advocacy work. I'm a proud member of the PD Avengers that Sonia founded. I helped found, uh, co-founded the Women's Parkinson's Project. I'm an ambassador for the Davis Finney Foundation. Um, I am going to be having a book published soon by Hatherley Press um, called Being Well. And I really believe in living well every day, even, um, even on the hard symptomatic day. So you're gonna, you're gonna see me with sort of a tough symptomatic day, folks. So, um, but I'm, I'm excited to talk about this. And I, um, we, hopefully Heather Kennedy will be able to log on here. She's trying to get the link. So there may be a few other people joining us throughout. Um, Anybody else, Mel, you want to, you introduced yourself. Anybody else want to jump in here or shall we dive into the content? Yeah, just go for it. I will manage the, the chat and the emails about links and everything. Sounds good. All right. So first off, I'm glad, glad you can join us today. And I think this is um, an area that we don't know a lot about. And, and I just want to say, having said my credentials here, I really think that Sonia is going to be the expert in this area because I think Sonia is the only one among us that has been pregnant uh, while well, having Parkinson's and, and dealt with it. So poor thing. She's like, what? I'm <laughs> here five minutes and I'm on the hot seat. So even though clinically, I know a lot about this area, I don't, um, I didn't treat anybody ever um, in my practice that had Parkinson's and um, had it has had a baby. But I think there's lots of questions that come up in managing chronic illness when you're pregnant. Um, so I'm going to talk about it sort of um, globally. And then um, I, but I, what I really want to say is we are not experts. There's not a lot of data about this. So we are in no way making medical recommendations about what you should or should not do. 
um, we're here more to have a discussion about perhaps what areas we need more research about and maybe the little bits of things that we've learned or each of us have maybe experienced. But again, this is not to, um, uh, in any way it is not meant to negate the need for you to talk with your provider if you're thinking about a pregnancy, <clears throat> want to have a baby, and, and or want to manage your contraceptive or hormonal needs differently. Okay, so it's kind of unchartered territory. I'm really happy to report, though, that this this topic is gaining a lot of traction internationally. We are starting to have more dialogue around um, <clears throat> what it's like to be female and to have Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. And th that includes things like pregnancy, perimenopause, postmenopause, hormonal replacement, contraception. Um, and and that's, that's in some ways more unique to the female experience. So um, um, we're just gonna be part of the dialogue. What I'd like to say is as a clinician who's, who's had the privilege of working with many, many pregnant women, that, that women's needs don't suddenly um, change just because they're pregnant. Some um, diseases we know may have um, less or fewer symptoms during pregnancy. Some diseases may experience more symptoms during pregnancy. It's complicated when you're taking medications to treat symptoms when you're pregnant. Um, and uh, because we can't ethically study medicines in pregnant women, we can't say, okay, you 25 pregnant women who have Parkinson's, we want you to take all of your medicine. And then you 25 women over here, we don't want you to take your medicine. And then let's see how your kids turn out, right? That's not ethical, right? <laughs> but we can do that in rats and we can do that in other, in other mammals. But there, for that reason, medicines are often categorized as in, in a letter system, A through X. So it's A, B, C, D, and X. A medicines are medicines that we know absolutely safe. We've tested them. We know what pregnant women have taken them forever. Um, and we know they're safe. There are very few A medicines. Even things like acetaminophen and prenatal vitamins aren't all labeled A. <laughs> so those are more the B medicines. We know that women have taken them. They haven't had poor outcomes. Um, we feel safe prescribing those. So A and B are somewhat the same. X are those things that we know are absolutely not safe to take during pregnancy. The reality is most medicines fall into that C category, which is we need to weigh the benefit to mom and try to minimize any harm or side effects to the growing fetus, right? To the growing baby. And as an advocate for women and for mothers, it's a really fine line and a dance that needs to be done. And I think it's important that we look at individuals because if we tell women that they can't take any of their medicine during their pregnancy, they may not have a, a, a quality of life that, that's gonna work to manage a pregnancy. We also know the first trimester of pregnancy is the most sensitive time as the baby's developing. And so maybe we can work to modify medicines that first trimester and work to modify symptoms later. So those are kind of some general guidelines. In terms of contraception, I'm just gonna give a little bit of information and then I really wanna open it up to discussion if that feels okay. Um, we, we seem to find that more women are diagnosed with Parkinson's around menopause. And, um, and, and that's pretty, pretty well documented. We feel pretty certain in that. Now, some of that reason is age, right? Because one of the risk factors for getting Parkinson's is just getting older. Um, we know currently that at least in the United States, we have more men that have Parkinson's than women. So another risk factor could be being male. We're going to kind of skip over that part today. Um, <clears throat> but for women, we wonder if perhaps declining hormones, maybe estrogen, um, may affect their ability to get Parkinson's. Does that maybe, so that's a question mark that we don't know. So we, we, we hypothesize around that. We think about that and we'd like to see more research done in that area. And if that's the case, if we find that to be the case, then is 
supplementing our estrogen a helpful thing or a protective thing. And that could be protective, not just for women, but potentially for men as well. If estrogen could be protective, it's not just women that, that could protect themselves with estrogen. There are other treatments that use other hormone treatments for male cancers, for example. And um, so I think it's, I think it's an untapped area of research. So um, that's sort of what we know, or rather an awful lot about what we don't know. And <laughs> what I would advocate for all of you that are out there saying, well, gosh, this is really not very informative. They're telling us all the things they don't know. What I really would love for you to do is have a dialogue with your provider. If you're noticing your symptoms are different and you are <clears throat> having your periods. We know that women seem to have more symptoms the week before their periods, which also would indicate that as that estrogen level is dropping, <clears throat> or as my friends in the UK say, the estrogen level, the estrogen um, is dropping, that they have more symptoms. Talk to your provider about it. Perhaps there can be some things that can be done to keep you less symptomatic that week before your period. If you're thinking about getting pregnant, talk to your providers about it. Be proactive about it. Don't automatically think, well, I absolutely can't have children. If that's something you've always wanted. There's ways to do that. So, um, so don't give up and have hope, even though we don't have data. Um, talk about it. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump off my little soapbox here, and I don't know if that was helpful, but, um, and I, I'd love, I'd love to just open it up for discussion. So I'd love, Sonia, if you're open to sharing a little bit about your experience about pregnancy and Parkinson's, um, I'd love to, to hand the, hand the mic to you. Sure, I can talk a little bit about my experience. It's a while ago. <laughs> my oldest is now 22, and I was pregnant with her actually when I found out about my diagnosis, which was an interesting time to receive that news versus trying to enjoy, you know, your first pregnancy and, and all the joys of, of anticipation of the coming of your new, new daughter. I had two more daughters after that. So my daughters are now 22, 20, and 16. So we're talking about a little while ago. Oh, hi, Heather. Um, so when I was first, um, when I was first pregnant, um, it was, it was an interesting time in that people really didn't know what to do with me. So when I went back to my OBGYN and said, I have Parkinson's disease, they think, then he was kind of like, okay, well, what do we do now? So it ended up being just, he just followed me along as anyone normally would. The second time when I became pregnant, I would, went to genetic, they sent me to genetic counseling. And then I saw, you know, a high risk OB specialist and, and, Again, I don't think they knew what to do with me, but everyone and their, their partner was in, in the room when I was delivering. It was just a packed room because they didn't know what to expect. So really my experience was, and this 16 um, year old, when she was born, it was pretty much like the first time. So the experiences were so varied and that's truly because as you said, Kat, we don't know enough about how to deal with women during their pregnancy and Parkinson's. There are far more questions and answers sometimes. So we have to kind of go by experience, as you said. Um, as far as I know from the reading I've done, there's no increased risk for fetal abnormalities or, or congenital defects in women that have Parkinson's disease, which is obviously a promising thing. But the management of symptoms is, is sometimes difficult. Also, as you said, um, for the first, first two pregnancies, I wasn't too bad because I really wasn't on a lot of medications. It was still early in the course of my disease. By the time I got to my third pregnancy, I really needed some, some help um, because the experience of pregnancy, as you know, has its own stresses on your body and you add Parkinson's into the mix and you're kind of stuck. So at that time, as we still believe now, um, the safest medication that we have for Parkinson's disease that would be, you know, not the class A or even necessarily class B, but um, is, is levodopa, carbidopa. And so I ended up taking a little bit of that. I waited until after the first trimester because again, very unanswered question. So I kind of suffered through my first trimester and then started taking it, I believe in my second. Um, so yeah, that, that was my experience. Very, very uh, uninformative con con considering there really wasn't many answers then, as I'm sure people find it difficult to find answers now. Sonia, was it scary for you? Did it feel like uncharted territory to be getting sort of 
to not really know, but be symptomatic enough that you needed medicine, you know, I, I wonder yeah. if that's frightening for you. Well, it, was, it wasn't as much frightening as confusing, I think. I mean, I, I, as I said, I didn't take anything for any of my first trimesters in pregnancy because I felt, you know, I knew that was sort of the most formative time. For the first two, I didn't take anything at all. I just kind of suffered through, but my symptoms were mild enough that I could do that. By the third time, as I mentioned, I had to go through. So it wasn't, it was um, not, I, I mean, I can imagine it would be frightening. I think a little bit with my medical background, I felt a little bit more confident about knowing what I knew and not knowing what I didn't know. So um, yeah, but it can be very, you know, you, you expect to go to your physician and be told this is what you should do. And um, as we've seen, with women in Parkinson's in general, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And symptom wise, did you, did you find that, that it changed? Did you feel different pregnant mm -hmm. than you did non-pregnant in terms of your symptoms? Definitely. I mean, definitely the symptoms were there when I wasn't on medication, but also I felt that my symptoms, um, were accelerated a little bit during the pregnancies. They seem to come back pretty much up back up to baseline, but they may have been a little bit, little bit worse during the time that I was pregnant. But as I said, as the hormones started to come back to normal, it was um, it was a little bit better than it was during the pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you for sharing so candidly. I know it's it's no like a <laughs> yeah. you say that hormones go back to normal at a certain point because I'm still waiting. <laughs> Oh, me too now, Heather. <laughs> I like then we're into menopause, which is really fun. Yes, yes. I say I'm 24 years postpartum as well. <laughs> <laughs> My youngest is 24. So, uh, yeah. So does anybody else have anything to add sort of to the pregnancy discussion? Part of as a midwife, I, I would think also that like I think about I did water births and I did a lot of labor support um, mm -hmm. that that I'd want to be careful with with straining um, muscles and positioning and those kinds of things um, mm -hmm. during labor, because we all know that we have more trouble with um, muscle tension and, and muscle related issues, but, but mechanically, from a mechanical standpoint, um, I, I think that there's no reason to think why mechanically a baby that can't be, be born just fine to mm -hmm. women with Parkinson's disease. So pillows and extra hands and, and contraptions on beds can do wonderful things to help women be comfortable, whether they have Parkinson's or not, comfortable as comfortable gets in labor. Um, right. but, but I think that there's lots of creative ways and there's great pain management for labor as well. So um, that could help us. May so, I mention a very useful item for people that have trouble rolling out of bed with Parkinson's, especially when they're pregnant? Please. I, I came across this quite by accident after Kat left. Kat was a huge help to me post-surgery. And as you know, with brain surgery, you can't really lift or put your head below your heart and all that. But there's this pulley system that you can buy. It links on to the bed. And if you have like a headboard, it's even easier. But if you don't, you can, you can fix it between the mattresses. It clips on. And you can pull yourself up with these loops. And it helps so much. I would imagine for pregnancy, it would be really great. I can't even imagine being pregnant and dealing with Parkinson's. I mean, what women are carrying with that is just incredible and awe-inspiring. I'm listening. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll put the link in there. Uh, what would you What would you say about uh, like morning sickness for uh, during pregnancy, and does that impact medication absorption? And what are some things that people, you know, can do if they have really bad morning sickness? Sure. So, so not everybody. It, it's interesting because morning sickness always gets the really dramatic bill, right? You know, on any of the films, you think, oh, she's vomiting in the morning that's a sign that the woman is pregnant, right? So, so nausea is, and fatigue are really much, much more common in pregnancy, especially in the first trimester than is actually vomiting. But if somebody's feeling yucky and having trouble with nausea and vomiting, you produce a lot more stomach acid when you're pregnant. So I would give a, a woman with Parkinson's the same advice that I would a woman without Parkinson's is to try to keep that stomach acid diluted 
So nibbling on, on things kind of around the clock and for Parkinson's folks on non-protein um, snacks so that they can tolerate their medicines all right. Um, and But if somebody's having sort of intractable vomiting, that's a problem regardless of whether they have Parkinson's disease. So, so keeping that stomach acid diluted, being careful about when you time your protein intake. Um, I would recommend a high fat, high protein snack at night. And often women that are pregnant are getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And so I, I often recommend keeping a little bit of a snack by the toilet in a Ziploc container so that they can nibble a little bit and, and uh, have some fluids and some carbohydrates when they get up in the middle of the night so they don't wake up on that totally high acid stomach. So um, that's that would be my, my, my take on that. And I think... Um, also recognizing that metabolisms of medicines might be a little bit different. And um, also something that I'd recommend is, is if you're thinking about a pregnancy, again, bring it up and talk about it early and talk about how you might manage your Parkinson's if you're planning a pregnancy. Only 50% of pregnancies in the, this country are planned. So if you find yourself pregnant, and, and have Parkinson's. And um, I would recommend going in right away and talking about it and talking about kind of what the trajectory should look like or some of the things that you can be doing. Um, you can also do things like take your prenatal vitamins at night with dinner if those are making you nauseous. Um, so there's, there's some strategies that you can work on so that you can tolerate um, uh, medicines, but also trying to minimize sort of some of the complications that can happen with any pregnancy. So did I answer that okay, Mel? Yes, absolutely. Okay, Miss Karen. Yeah, uh, I was racking my brain for how I could could offer some value here in this conversation because I'm perimenopausal, I've never had children, and I got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease after I had my last period. So I was thinking, what can I do? And, and you are female. <laughs> yeah, and I am female, but um, I was I was talking to Mel beforehand, and she said, "Well, you're medical," and I started thinking about. Uh, you know, when I used to do anesthesia for OB a lot more, um, there are some considerations that you might want to keep in mind with Parkinson's disease and having an anesthetic, whether that's an epidural or a spinal anesthetic, or even an emergency general anesthesia, or even just some pain management, things like managing post-operative or intraoperative nausea and vomiting, blood pressure, things that uh, are affected by the physiology of pregnancy, and also to keep in mind with Parkinson's one of the things that came to mind for me is that some people take MAOB inhibitors, which are drugs like selegiline, rosagiline. Um, those drugs, a lot of uh, a lot of people in medicine aren't that familiar with MAOB inhibitors in terms of neurologic disease. They're more familiar with what's called an MAOA inhibitor, which is given uh, for psychiatric conditions as an antidepressant. And those drugs famously have a lot of food interactions and drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions. And so people in their mind, they, they hear that you're on an MAO inhibitor and they might think of those things. Um, but one concern if you are going to have anesthesia for labor and delivery would be uh, to come armed with some information for your anesthesia provider about what uh, nausea drugs that you should not be getting, drugs such as metoclopramide or regulin, um, haldol paradol, uh, sometimes given um, in low doses for nausea. Those are not uh, very good in the setting of Parkinson's disease because they work on dopamine receptors. They're much safer drugs. So um, I know the American Parkinson's Disease Association has a little card and it has a uh, drugs which perhaps to be given with caution in people with Parkinson's disease. So that's helpful. And I do believe that the Parkinson's Foundation has a kit called Aware and Care. Mm -hmm. And that is a kit which is uh, supposed to be geared toward the perihospital experience. And if you are going to be having a baby, um, that might be helpful information. It has sort of a sample letter that you can provide about your condition and medications that you take and various other things. But, um, you know, one other thing is that people with Parkinson's sometimes have fluctuations in their blood pressure. Um, they have sort of an autonomic dysfunction and, uh, you know, it's very well managed in the setting of anesthesia with medications and fluids, but, uh, 
it's something to be um, aware of and probably discuss with your anesthesia provider if you get lightheaded when you're standing up. Um, if you have low blood pressure as a baseline with your Parkinson's disease, that would be helpful to let someone know. Karen, would it be helpful? Um, I often had patients who had um, medical challenges during pregnancy. They would schedule a consult before delivery yes. with the anesthesia team so that it was all documented and in their record of kind of kind of about what the plan should be, could be. Again, this is I'm, I'm asking women to take a lot of ownership with this part and, yes. and advocate for themselves before labor. Labor is a hard time you know, when you're in the midst of having a baby and at the hospital, it's a hard time to be making decisions in the moment. Mm -hmm. So planning ahead is a really good plan. Um, uh, I'd like to also mention that the American Parkinson's uh, Association has things, but so the Davis Finney Foundation has some great tools about getting ready for a hospital stay also on their website and in the um, Every Victory Counts manual. So there's lots of tools yeah. for women to be proactive um, with their stay. And this is across the board, I'd like to say. Heather, I know Heather and I had some of these conversations about um, you know, going into any surgery. So this is not just about, is not just unique to being female, it's, it's, it's unique to being human. <laughs> and you know, um, I, I'm seeing Heather's comment here um, about taking medications uh, when you're in the hospital. I do think it's important to bring your medications with you. First of all, some of the medications aren't available on formulary at every hospital. I take extra carbidopa and that's very, uh, it's they not wouldn't, available. They wouldn't let me access them. They would that, not that let me get my bed. That it was is a unbelievable. Problem. It was unbelievable. I was dystonic and twisted and they wouldn't let me get my own meds. That was difficult. I, I know when I was in the hospital, I had a similar experience, but the pharmacist actually took the medications. They examined them. They looked them up on the computer, made sure they were what I said they were. But some of my medications came from Canada. They aren't even available in the United States, such as Domperidone. So, uh, you know, they really had a field day with that one, but I kind of, you know, had them in my bag anyways, and uh, had that in my corner. But as far as the pre-anesthesia workup, you were saying that a lot of people can go in ahead of time, cat and talk to an anesthesia provider. Um, that's pretty routine um, for many types of surgeries. And it's called a pre-anesthetic CPAP, which stands for uh, something pre-anesthesia. Uh, I don't even know what it stands for. That's horrible. I just say CPAP. But, um, you know, where mm -hmm. patients are seen and they can pre-look at their labs and their meds and make recommendations. So... CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. That's a different CPAP. Oh, that's a different CPAP. <laughs> that I know. <laughs> okay, good. I know something. Me, me. No. <laughs> um, so I that, wrist watch. that made me think about uh, doing the consult is, you know, a lot of times you will have a primary OBGYN, right? That you're planning on going through the whole process with. They know about your Parkinson's. They're all tuned in. Everything's going to be great. And then they're off. Somebody's somebody else in the practice. Yeah. Right. So having those conversations with the whole team is, is important. One thing that's nice about having an electronic medical record, which is now pretty much the standard of care everywhere, is that those notes and those directives should be noted in your, your medical record. And I think being proactive about that is really important. I practiced in a um, group practice setting and um, we ha had to keep thorough notes. There were 13 of us. So um, uh, seven core midwives, but, but any of my partners could be on call during the time of delivery. So it was important that we take really copious notes and um, keep an up-to-date, what we call problem list, which is not my favorite term, but a lot of notes were kept specifically in that area to communicate between providers. So um, I think that's, it's an excellent point, Mel. Um, and, and that also goes, you know, for just being proactive, asking for those appointments. Some hospital systems, um, and I know not everybody, everybody delivers in a hospital system, but when you have a chronic illness, I think it's a good idea to deliver in a hospital system. Um, and so that you can have the tools available that you need and, and being proactive about that is important. And what I learned a lot from Heather's case, um, 
is that you even if in a center for excellence in a highly rated facility that does a lot of work with people with Parkinson's, they don't always have everything ready for you at the hospital. So I think asking the questions, being really direct and saying, hey, I heard a webinar and I'm having a uh, a procedure done. I need to have my gallbladder removed. Oh gosh, I remember they said to talk about it ahead of time. So as soon as you know that you're having a procedure done, bring it up. I've got Parkinson's disease. Get your medicines together. Get somebody to help advocate for you if you're not able to advocate for yourself. Yeah, so, I think that's really important, Kat, that you mentioned the last part, because I think that when you're in a situation, especially say pregnancy and you're about to, you know, you're going into labor, you're not necessarily going to have the fortitude to be able to <laughs> <laughs> to to advocate for yourself very well. So having things written down mm -hmm. and having a, a hopefully a care partner or someone go with you that can advocate for you on your behalf, I think is really important. The one thing just to get back to the medication piece is that um, amantadine we know is not good for, for pregnancies and, and for, for the growing fetus. So that's one thing that, you know, if you happen to be taking and you find yourself pregnant, you need to, you know, discuss that with your physician right away or, or you know, try and discontinue your use of that before you get to them. Um, the other one thing to remember if you bring your own medications is that certain things are not necessarily the best for breastfeeding if you go that route either. So you need to check with your physician about that. I mean, things like dopamine agonists, for instance, will suppress prolactin, which will interfere with your lactation in the, uh, in the postpartum period. So medications are some, one thing that we, we know some things, but not everything, but so it's important to discuss the possible scenarios with your physician before you get into that situation. And many health systems where you deliver, sorry, then Heather's up. When you deliver, often you'll have the opportunity to meet with a um, lactation specialist in the hospital. I think that that's imperative to do that before you're discharged mm -hmm. um, or make arrangements to do that. And there's lots of resources um, um, available, but I agree with you. Having having things written down is really helpful, and having somebody who can help advocate for you if you're not in a in a headspace to do that. And that's again universal. Heather, all yours. I was just going to mention that in this tech innovation seminar that I've been attending with Rui and John Dean and a bunch of others, they're talking about having some sort of a band that we could wear that could be scanned. But there are so many privacy issues in particular in America, because oftentimes someone will be traveling or something unexpected will happen like a, like a fall or you know an accident. And so we don't have time to prepare. So to prepare ahead, at least fill out that little form that you get from the Parkinson's Foundation that Karen mentioned, I think it was. Mm -hmm. You talked about the kit you can order, care, aware and care kit. That is so important to have that with you. Just take in your wallet and have in your phone, not only your ICE contact, but under that, just for the emergency personnel, because that's what they're going to be looking for is ICE in America anyway, and make sure that you list your, your medications there. Just, just have them somewhere in case you can't talk or in case you can't communicate or in case your loved one is not with you, because you just never know. It's better to be prepared. So whether you're pregnant or not, or whether you're, you know, whatever's happening in your life, we have a body that we have to contend with and we have more to our body than just Parkinson's. So let's, let's be prepared ahead of time. I wish I had known, I wish I had thought of that before my kidney surgery and my shoulder surgery and some other things that were more immediate. I yeah. take a photograph of my current prescriptions and I fold it up and I stick it in my wallet and, and all that does is it just because I often will just have loose pills or in my pill case, right? I mean, who wants to carry around the big, huge, you know, bottles, but I have a photograph of that in my wallet. And I think that that's helpful for those same reasons, Heather, for those same reasons. So yeah, Karen, you. Uh, I, I also received an Apple Watch for Christmas, which was great. I never had one. And on the Apple Watch, it has, uh, oh, it's talking to me. It's actually listening. Um, it has a sort of a medical ID that's digital and you can actually program all your medications, any allergies that you have, any pertinent medical information or conditions, contact people, your doctor's name and number. It's actually pretty a, a cool feature of the Apple Watch. So if anybody uses an Apple Watch, that might be helpful. That was one thing. And then Kat, I also wanted to mention something related to pregnancy and lactation. A friend of mine, who doesn't have Parkinson's was taking Domperidone to help with breast milk production. Do you know anything about that? I know that's a common medication for people with Parkinson's. Um, I do actually, and, and prescribed it 
um, often to women that were having lactation issues in terms of milk supply issues. So um, I know that it's it's more complicated to get now on many, it's not carried in the formulary. So it's something that we had to um, be sure was stocked postpartum. I also do want to say that, you know, it's been five years since I've been practicing in the hospital. So um, while I try to keep somewhat up to date about what's going on, I, again, I'm going to give my disclaimer that I'm not the most up to date on all those pieces, but yes, it can help with lactation for sure. And I also want to add, I think you made a really good point, Sonia, that some of the medicines for Parkinson's can be detrimental, we know, in the first trimester. And But but definitely talk to your doctor because some, stopping some cold turkey can also be really um, harmful for you. So, so just being aware of all of it. That's why if, if you yes. can your pregnancy, plan ahead, talk about what's good. Maybe sometimes we can shift a medicine that is safer right. or known to be safer, like carbidopa, levodopa, try to, to, to futz with those a little bit to, to make it safer. Yeah. Especially oh, no, ab absolutely. I mean, when you're talking about some of the MAOB inhibitors, for instance, and other medications, it can be very dangerous to stop a cold turkey on your own. Um, but amantadine is really ones that you should discuss with your physician about, because if you're planning to become pregnant, that's one that you probably want to change. I also, I'd like to shift a little bit. I think we did a really good job. Does everyone feel good about kind of what we covered about what we know and don't know about pregnancy? Because <laughs> I do want to spend some time talking a little bit about contraception too. Um, and, and, and I wouldn't be a good midwife if I didn't talk about both in the same breath. So um, if you don't want to get pregnant, I think it's also important that you take steps not to become pregnant if you're sexually active and think about um, and talk to your provider about what uh, a ways not to do that. And there's lots of contraceptive out contraceptive options out there that are absolutely compatible with, um, with Parkinson's and Parkinson's medicines. So um, I would advocate that an unwanted pregnancy can be a stressful thing and can be physiologically challenging on a body. So I, I, I would really encourage you to not think that that's going to complicate things, um, trying to get on a contraception. Um, there are even some non-hormonal, there's lots of non-hormonal, non-medicine contraceptive options. Um, and I wouldn't be doing you a service unless I talked about both. Um, I know that I used um, a copper uh, T IUD that didn't have any hormones in it for a long time. And IUDs are the most um, common form of birth control in Europe. In, in the U United States, we haven't quite caught up with them in terms of it being a favorite, but it's nice because it's implanted in an office visit and then you don't have to think about it for several years. And most women um, report really high satisfaction rates with that as a, as a um, contraceptive option. There's the Marina IUD also that has small amounts of progesterone that mostly stay localized to the uterus. Um, some people will have more systemic effects because anything that's in our body, you can't say, oh, it just stays right there, right? It, there's little bits of it that seep into the bloodstream, um, but that can be a useful tool. And some women really love that they have lighter periods or no periods at all. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not having fluctuations cyclically with some of their estrogen levels. So I'm not sure that we can say that it would prevent dropping estrogen levels and some of that, what would be before your cycle time, maybe increase in symptoms, but it may help theoretically to have that little bit of progesterone on board. So that may be an option for women who really know that are, are not interested in being pregnant, who are sexually active and are premenopausal, right? We're getting narrow and narrow. So I'm talking to like six of you out there, but no. I'm kidding, um, uh, that, that that could be a really helpful tool. So just remember that those tools exist. And um, yeah, that's my soapbox for that one. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else to add to that? Mel, are you getting any questions coming in? I haven't- yeah, I was just gonna say, if anybody um, would like to share some questions in the chat, um, we've got these four women who have so much insight to share. Um, maybe just a question you're curious about, curious about for women in general, women's health in general, um, or because you're thinking about becoming pregnant or you're, you are pregnant. Any questions are totally open. 
I thought I might also add, we, we, um, I was part of a kind of an informal re research study that was asking women, are providers that they're seeing asking about their periods or about their cycles or about menopause? And what we're finding is that most providers are pretty, other than those of us doing OB and reproductive health, are, are pretty uncomfortable bringing it up in the exam room. So I think it's, it's really important that we as women recognize that having that menstruating and going through menopause is a, is a really integral part of our experience. Um, and any of you out there having hot flashes or are currently pregnant really know how really integral it is. <laughs> um, but it's, it's important to have the discussion because we, our providers may be uncomfortable bringing it up. They haven't been trained in these specific areas. So we need to be comfortable bringing it up. Hey, I'm really having these hot, hot flashes. I'm noticing I'm more symptomatic when I'm having the hot flashes. You know, is there something we can do? And yeah, Karen. Yeah, I, I actually just went to my uh, GYN for a hormone check because I, I mentioned that I was perimenopausal and I started on hormone replacement therapy about six months ago. And, uh, you know, between being a newlywed and uh, being perimenopausal and trying new medications, I mean, I have anxiety and depression as non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's and my neurologist, along with my psychiatrist, recommended that I switch to a uh, new antidepressant that had more coverage for anxiety associated with Parkinson's, which was an SNRI, which was a desphenlafaxine, I think it's a generic name, but that has some sexual side effects and it can blunt um, pleasure during sex, if you will. Like you, you just can't climax. I mean, you could go like an hour think you're going to, and then you just can't. And I mean, you know, it's difficult to talk about, but sex is important. It's part of life. It's part of being a happy person, you know, as happiness for my husband as well. So, um, you know, it was nice to be able to talk about that. I wanted to bring up one thing. Um, this is not medical advice by any means. And I know people have different opinions on medical cannabis and that kind of thing, but that actually is something that can really help with libido and sexual pleasure in people that are having side effects from the medication. And my neurologist said that um, he also men mentioned that you can like skip your dose that afternoon of your SSRI or your SNRI if you have, um, and then take it after sexual um, intercourse or sexual activity later in the night. So I thought those were interesting suggestions that people might want to look into or investigate. And that, Karen, that's a really, really good example of you bringing it up to your provider. Our providers also can't read our minds. Um, and while I believe that it would be good practice for us to encourage providers to ask more questions around women's health, um, they can't automatically know that we're having trouble. They also, not everybody experiences every possible side effect of medication. Mm -hmm. So so if we don't bring it up and advocate for ourselves, like saying I'm too flat, I don't love that I love that my anxiety has gone, but I don't like that I can't have an orgasm and I'm newly married, you know, that that's affecting my quality of life. And so is there a way that we can work with it? And that's a beautiful example of coming up with an individualized plan for you to try some trial and error. So yeah, Heather. I am so grateful that you brought this up, Karen, because it's kind of like, have you ever had a massage and you realize, wow, I was really tense or you take a yoga class and you think I'm going to do this every day. It felt so good. And then you don't, but that's another story, but you realize how tense you are. So when you don't have quality of life, when you're experiencing such consistent chronic pain, I believe what happens is that we become, that becomes normalized. We cannot let the absence of pleasure and joy and even orgasms become normalized because what life needs this. We will be missing the joie de vivre. We will be missing that essence. We will be feeling less alive. And what is worse for a neurologic patient than feeling diminished even further than going smaller with your voice and being caved in on your body and not being able to move much. And then also lacking that, that Oof, that pleasure, we need it. It is our God-given right. It is something that everyone should experience. You know, it, it's just a human right. I believe it. 
-hmm. So I cannot stress enough how important that is what Karen just said. And thank you for being brave enough to bring that up. That's We've all true. tried those different inhibitors and they do flatline you. They make you feel like you're wah, wah. It's like, well, I'm not upset, but I'm also not feeling anything. And I, I want to say that I, I, I think it was super brave of you, Karen, and I love that you're newlywed. And I, but I'm, I'm also going to say after my husband and I have been married 31 years. Ah, that's a long time. I'm really only, you know, 26. But, um, but, I, but even that's important to us. You know, our our health as a couple is complex and layered. But a part of that is certainly the intimate part. And and I'm currently, and you know, as a woman in my 50s, really trying to maximize and and store and collect and challenge myself to find joy in every moment and every day. Maybe not every moment, but every day at least. And and the more the more joy we can collect, the better off we'll be. So, I don't know. That's Do a, walk that talk. I've seen it. You you actually I, I've seen you catch yourself saying something, and you'll switch and flip it and use different language even to sort of promote the idea that you have some control over your situation. And you know all of I this. I pay Heather every month a small stipend to come on and. <laughs> But all of this is so universal. This goes so it far is. beyond Parkinson's, right? Like we can all relate to this as women and as just as human beings. So I really appreciate you guys bringing all this up. But but one more thing that I thought of too, um, staying connected to other women is so important, If especially when we're going through these transitions, because that's where we get the wealth of our information from. So I'm even taking notes as I attend this myself. So thanks. Sonia, do you have any tidbits about how you find joy in your day? We've been kind of dominating this. Any, any advice to somebody maybe, maybe that's diagnosed that's in their 30s and contemplating having a baby? Do you have any words of, of wisdom or advice? Well, I always look to you as, as uh, somebody who has walked this path longer than I. So I'm so appreciative of your insights. Well, I, I may have been on this path, but I really was on a good path for, <laughs> for the entire time. It took me a while to figure out the fact that I wasn't going to wake up one day and this would all be done. You know, that, you know, I'd wake up all flexible and supple and, you know, life would be back to normal. Um, so I, I did avoid it and kind of, you know, um, buried myself in busyness of life for a long time before I came to the realization that this wasn't going to change. And I didn't have control over that diagnosis, but all I had control over was how I was going to face the challenges that it brought. And that I was becoming a pessimistic person and that's not who I wanted to be. And that optimism for me had to become a choice. Not an easy choice, but a choice nevertheless, because there is that moment in time between a stimulus and a reaction that you have in order to make a decision about how you're going to react to the situation. And, and that's sort of become my mantra that, you know, optimism is a choice and I choose to be optimistic and hopeful and helpful because the fact is, what's the other choice? <laughs> it's not a great option. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's the way I looked at, you know, when it came to my daughters, yes, I was, I didn't know I was, um, had Parkinson's disease when I had my first child, obviously, or at the time I got pregnant with my first child, obviously, but I didn't let that slow me down. You know, I wanted to have more children. I wanted to have, you know, um, at least two or three kids. And that's what I ended up doing. And I will say that they have been probably the most, the stabilizer in my life. You know, they have brought me joy and they, they, I, I worried at first, I'll, I will say that. I mean, I went through a period of time, especially after my first child was born that I would look at her and think, you know, what, what, you know, am I going to be a burden in her life? Am I going to actually be able to see her during her first milestones? Am I going to be an active mother, am I gonna be, you know, am I gonna be able to keep up with the other mothers? And those, those are very natural and normal fears. I think that every woman has, regardless of whether they have BD, but it's obviously amplified for women that have a chronic illness. But I will say that, you know, you learn to adapt, you learn to modify the activity according to your capabilities, you learn to ask for help. And you also will see that, you know, for me, I know that this experience has brought my daughters a sense of reality that not life isn't always going to be purpose per perfect, but how they face the challenges will, will determine what kind of people they are. And they've learned empathy. They've learned, you know, charity. They've learned a lot from this, this um, experience. So those fears are normal and natural for any woman that is in that situation. But I will say that, you know, it'll be the greatest blessing that you have and, and, the, and your children can learn from every experience, including this one. 
Yeah, I, I really love how we, we started out to talk about these specific things that we don't know a lot about. And yet it, it often, all of our conversations come back to the core, um, uh, kind of the essence of being human, right? We all have choices. There, there's very few humans that I know that haven't had adversity somewhere in their lives, right? Um, and, and how we react to it really will define who we are. So, um, and I think when it comes to being female, to being wives and sisters and daughters and mothers and cousins and you know all of the things we we carry with us that often that caretaker mode and it can be a gift to our fellow women including our daughters and our sons about how we how we interact and how we grow through the challenges that we have so i think it's um I love that we come back to the big philosophy of being human, even though we're talking about these really specific subjects. And I, and I hope our, our, our listeners, our viewers feel like they were able to glean a little bit of insight. Um, I know we, we said a lot about what we don't know, but I think as a community, we can really grow if we can keep having the discussions and keep talking about it and being honest and open. Karen, I wanna thank you again for your bravery. Same with you, Sonia, I'm always picking on you about, you know, you're my, my go-to partner in, in, in a lot of these things, but I really appreciate you being candid about what it was like to be pregnant. And Heather, of course, you inspire me every day. So, um, and I wanna also thank Mel and the Davis Finney Foundation for giving us the, the, um, the place to come and talk about some of these things because I think it's really powerful. And um, I think that women can change the world and maybe we're starting to do that a little bit here with our conversations. So Mel, is there anything else you want us to, to touch on or? No, I think you guys nailed it. Really appreciate you guys talking. Heather, yeah. I just wanted to add, there are some policymakers in play, not just in the United States, but internationally, that are trying to add the component of women's health back into the system as it was removed when people were going toe to toe about abortion or no abortion and all that. And that's not what I wanted to talk about, but I just wanna say there's some policy changes that will benefit all, especially women in the reproductive years. And in so vote too, yeah. share your voices, share your stories, talk to your providers and vote, <laughs> that's all. Yes, speak up, speak out, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to all of you for joining us today as well. And if you have questions about this topic, feel free to um, let us know at blog at dpf.org. We are really grateful to have this community and these really amazing women to talk about these issues that are really front and center for a lot of people. So we look forward to seeing you in June. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Bye. Bye.